There are few spectacles in sport which match up to the poignancy of the FIFA World Cup final. On Sunday in Moscow, a country with a population of just 4 million will contest the biggest game in world football. Hello and welcome to Theatre of Dreams on World is One News. My name is Yash Jha and Croatia, who would have dared to imagine our World Cup finalists? A nation just 30 years old has ended the dreams of football's founding fathers to put celestial wings to their own. We're joined as ever by our master tacticians, Ashley Westwood and Eugene Sindlingdo. Ashley, you'd think I'd be offering my commiserations, but instead I want to take the benefit of hindsight and congratulate you as an Englishman for what surely should be remembered as a campaign to be proud of. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's the... the probably the, the message going through the media and, and coming out of the camp but I think when you get so close certainly having no expectation I think before the tournament you think yeah great we'll get to the semi-finals what a, a success that is but I think with it being Croatia and with us being one step away and then playing maybe France in the final it just feels like uh, it was an opportunity missed and, and what could have been is probably the feeling that everyone's having rather than uh, you know we've done well which we have but it, it just it takes a while to sink in. Eugene, Croatia were given a 3% chance at the start of this World Cup to be in the final. But when life says uh, the odds are against you, sport says there is always a chance. Uh, obviously, I mean, uh, when you actually go into a tournament, everyone goes there to win. They were like, so they had the goal in sight and it just shows that when you work hard, you do your best, you do everything right. It doesn't matter what the odds say. You know, when, you, when you're giving your best, you will succeed. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat both imposters the same. A lot to laud about Gareth Southgate and his young Lions, Ashley, and I'll come to that later. But let's talk about the 120 minutes first. England will feel they missed out on an opportunity, but at the same point, you've got to doff your hat to Croatia for their resilience. Without a doubt, I thought, you know, second half, Croatia obviously, you know, took the game by the scruff of the neck and, and England were on the back foot a little bit. But then the longer it goes on, certainly when it hits extra time, you think, you know, we've weathered the storm, if you like, and now all of a sudden you're going to see England's fitness come through because Croatia have already had two extra times. But it was anything but. If anything, Croatia got stronger. They looked to, to relish the, the extra time. They were still chasing lost causes. They were still pressing England. And it was England that was on the back foot. So for somehow they've, they've found an extra gear, Croatia. They've found something from within. And that's where the mentality comes in. Um, you know, they, they really did push hard to the 120th minute and you have to say as, as much as it hurts you that you know Croatia deserved it. Eugene, three knockout matches for Croatia at this World Cup, all three going into extra time, two of them into shootouts before this. In all three they have overturned deficits, that's never happened before thrice in a row by any team in the World Cup. Even This would be a monumental effort even for a giant of the game, for a team which came into the tournament ranked 20th, it's all the more special. Yeah, it just shows that they, they, they had then the, the motivation, the courage. No, it, moreover, their goal in mind was to succeed in this tournament. And as a nation, as players who are actually, who are, I mean, what to say, they're more proud of where they come from. And, you know, you could see the messages that they're saying, we will fight no matter how hard it is going to be for us, even though we've played uh, two matches earlier in extra time, with extra time. So, so like, it's just, I mean, like coach is saying, come from within, yeah, it just shows that they were really hungry. And it's just that extra push that they had given which out overcame England. It was that doggedness of the collective effort, not to say that England weren't trying, but you saw Mario Mandzukic, he was barely walking, but he managed to get the ball into the net. But outside of that, how special were Ivan Perisic and Luka Modric, who was slowly but surely building himself up as a Ballon d'Or contender? Yeah, I mean, you know, you'd, you'd put money on, on Modric winning the Golden Ball, that's for sure, this tournament. Um, you know, he different with Perisic. I think Modric completely dominated the game, regards possession, regards controlling it, playing at his tempo. You know, very rarely was there a straight pass. And then Perisic was kind of like the catalyst for, for uh, Croatia. He was pressing every, every ball. You know, he wasn't giving England time at the back to make combinations of passes. And that, in effect, had a knock-on to England, because England then started knocking long balls and started slashing at things. You could see like, a bit of anxiety creeping into England's play. And it was set off just by the tireless running and, and the pressurisation of, of Perisic. So, you know, to a man, you know, that's, you know, even if you're a defender and you see your forwards running like that, it gives everyone a lift. So they had, uh, you know, a massive effect on the game in, in different capacities. Was there any, uh, would you at any level say 
England lost the game tactically in the second half by deciding to sit back. What was it that went wrong? I think wrong? they did, uh, and, and I don't think it would have been a tactic that was given from the sidelines. Um, you know, I, I was pretty sure that Gareth Southgate half time would have been saying same again. You know, let, let's keep playing. We're going to get a goal. Let's keep pushing for the next goal. But because the prize is so big, and I think because the, the side is so young and inexperienced. I think subconsciously you start protecting what you have. Uh, you're winning one nil. You think if they obviously keep a clean sheet here, 45 minutes, don't concede, don't concede, don't concede, and that's what they would have been saying in each other's heads, even to each other. Come on, keep it tight, keep it tight, don't concede. And then you stop playing, and then all of a sudden, subconsciously the ball comes, and, you, and you're not relaxed, and you don't find a white shirt, you don't pass the simple pass to play next to you. You start forcing clearances. I mean, we've seen five or six poor clearances. We even seen Pickford, who's te uh, technically very good, you know, knock a couple of like low balls, uh, hurried clearances, and it starts to creep in, and all of a sudden, you're on the back foot, and, and that you know spurs Croatia on, and they start to get a little bit more confident, and it's kind of a snowball effect, and before you know it, you know, with the amount of possession and dominance that Croatia has, there's going to be a defensive lap somewhere, and that's exactly what happened. And what could have been so close ended up, looking at it, uh, being so far, uh, we also are attempting to get a sense of uh, what the mood is like in London. We showed how buzzing the atmosphere was, of course. England has been uh, replete with uh, dreams through this campaign. And we're joined to get a sense of that by uh, my colleague Ollie Barrett, who joins us from London. Ollie, uh, good day to you. How has England woken up this morning? Really mixed emotions, I think it's fair to say. Uh, obviously, England fans hoped that they would be celebrating all night and looking forward to a final on Sunday. That is clearly not the case. Uh, I think that England fans, uh, when they step back a little, when the uh, wounds have healed, will uh, accept that they saw an England team overachieving here in terms of expectations through the tournament but it is so painful for England fans that they came so close and that they were in control of that game in the first half against Croatia and didn't press on, didn't press that advantage home and then did allow to, uh, Croatia to take control of the game in the second half. So uh, as I say mixed emotions here in London from fans proud of what the team achieved, uh, accepting of the fact that it was an overachievement really in terms of expectations, but desperately disappointed with how the team performed in the second half and, and how close they came to that, uh, that first final since 1966. Absolutely, Oli. The few headlines that we've managed to catch here suggest a sense of pride which uh, one isn't necessarily accustomed to seeing from the English media over the last decade in particular. Uh, is, that, is that sentiment echoed across the board in England at the moment? Yeah, that's absolutely right. It, it is a, a very different media reaction than we've seen to this tournament exit than we've seen in uh, in almost every tournament exit probably since 1996. Actually, uh, the media uh, very positive about this England team. I've got some of the uh, the, Eng uh, the English papers here. We've got the Sun, um, uh, one of the most read tabloids here. They're coming home, but everyone is a hero on the back page. Um, we have 23 Lions talking about pride uh, despite the tears and the torment. The uh, the Daily Mirror also talks about heroes that is a, uh, a constant refrain from the the uh, front pages of the English papers national treasures Southgate's brave lions restore faith in the England dream uh, Gareth Southgate saying I can't ask any more from the players uh, the Times goes with a full page picture talking about a pride of lions and talk, describing it as a glorious World Cup run uh, lots of pictures of uh, when Trippier scored and we all thought things were going to turn out very different um, and in the Daily Express we're coming home but with head held high again pride of lions there's a, there's a theme running through all of this as you see uh, we live the dream thank you England and that is the difference in terms of the media reaction to this exit from the tournament is that there is um, a sense of pride but also a sense of positivity and a, a sense in which the media media and the fans realize that they've enjoyed this tournament they've enjoyed watching England they of course they didn't watch them they enjoy watching them lose against Croatia and crash out of the tournament but they have uh, approved of some of the performances they've approved of the uh, the playing style right. doesn't mean that all the performances were perfect doesn't mean that all of the uh, that there are no mistakes to iron out and doesn't mean that Gareth Southgate is yet a perfect international manager but the, the, the reaction at the moment is overwhelmingly positive Right, it is a wondrous sight for the rest of the world to see an English media which is happy about its football. Thank you, Oli Barat, for getting us that perspective all the way from London. I uh, appreciate your time and effort. Uh, Ashley, uh, we go back to what uh, we've heard from Gareth Southgate, all the comments coming out. Uh, 
Yes, there might have been a small section of a troll army coming out on social media last night and saying, laughing about how it's not coming home. But the homeland has accepted football over the last month in a way it hasn't for many years. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, there's been a, a positivity around the performances and, and where we got to, obviously, in the tournament. And that was because there was no expectation in the way it was handled going into the tournament with the manager incorporating the media and explaining that this is a young team, it's a building process. You know, most of these players, you, you're more or less certain, will be together in four years' time for the next World Cup, with the exception of, of maybe Ashley Young and, and Jamie Vardy, but I think everybody else will be involved. So you, you get the impression that we're going to be stronger. You get the impression that they're going to learn from these experiences, which, which they will. And sometimes you have to, you know, lose, lose the hard way, I suppose, to, to have these mental scars to improve, improve you in the future. Uh, most of these players, nearly all of them, really, haven't played much tournament football before, so they'll all be stronger for it. And I think that's the message that Gareth Southgate's trying to put across, is the fact that it's a positive thing, although that we're out. And the average age of the squad, Eugene, of course, was under 26 when they travelled to Russia. So uh, you do see definitely a few more majors in most of them in the core of this team. And you, you think uh, the future looks brighter than it did at any point in, say, the last decade? Yeah, it does look like. And you look at the uh, under-17s England, the under-20s, the under-19s, they're actually champions right now. I mean, under-17s are champions of the world, the under-20 as well, and the under-19s are champions of Europe. So, Absolutely. you know, you have a, a group of players that are coming in and going to make this present uh, squad of players stronger. So. I know, I mean, they're very young and they've played, they've done really well with the experience that they're going to get out of this tournament. So it's going to make them better and I, eventually, you know, like with the experience that they get, maybe they can, you know, win a, win a World Cup in the coming year or uh, the Euro perhaps. All right, uh, Ashley, I, I do also want to talk about the Croatian perspective on this. Uh, you know, this is a cricket obsessed part of the world and I'm going to try drawing some sort of a parallel. Cricket has a World Cup coming up next year, which will feature all of 10 countries. And here you have football, the biggest sport in the world, and you have a country with a population of just 4 million, which is going to play the biggest game in the sport in the World Cup final. It just shows, uh, it's, it's a lesson that from football that perhaps other sports can take. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, the, the, the numbers don't really add up. If you mean, you know, you're talking about 4 million people and, and what percentage of that 4 million actually play football. I think the difference really is that the number one sport in Croatia is football. It's, it's part of their culture. You know, kids will be playing it on the streets. Kids will be playing it, you know, from the age of, of two, three, four, five years of age. So that it is their, their first port of call regards of sport. But it just shows you that, you know, if, if the country gets behind each other, if you put your mind to it, you, know, can, you can achieve anything. Um, you know, that's possibly one of the reasons Indian are, are so good at cricket. It's, it's their number one sport, as, uh, as is football is with Croatia. All right. Agony and ecstasy in the same moment. Uh, that's what sport gives us. Uh, that's what Moscow witnessed uh, last night. And we have Lucy Taylor joining us from Moscow, I believe. Uh, the, the same city which goes on to host the big one, the final, in just three days' time. Uh, Lucy, a uh, myriad of emotions, I'm sure, last night and uh, today as well. Uh, what are you taking stock of in terms of uh, the fans you see from either side? What is the sentiment like? Take us through what Moscow is feeling like at the moment. Yeah, well, like you say, agony and ecstasy in the same moment. What a night for Croatia, um, as you've just been saying. Such a small country to reach the first ever World Cup final. There have been Croatian fans, of course, here in Moscow. I felt last night that there were more England fans around the town. Thousands had flown in um, to go and see the game in the stadium and also to just be in Moscow for this moment. But I think from now, we'll obviously get more fans from Croatia uh, coming across as well. The atmosphere has been good all the way through this tournament and so now it really feels like it's building to a climax here in Moscow ready for that uh, final game on Sunday um, many many fans you know many Russians getting behind these different teams after Russia was knocked out by Croatia Russians have had to take on new favorites in this tournament so uh, there's a few rivalries building between Russians as well but all in all people are watching the game together people are celebrating and commiserating together and the atmosphere has been great all the way through Yes, and now all of them, whoever is in Moscow, whoever isn't, is waiting with bated breath for that biggest night in this sport. Uh, keeping your uh, uh, English uh, side aside, of course, I hope you enjoy uh, that final in Moscow. Lucy, thank you for bringing us 
that report. Uh, let's move on with the show. Uh, time and again, over the past month, we have remarked about the remarkability of this edition of the greatest single sport event and Russia 2018's last act. However it pans out, will be a storyline befitting of the jaw-dropping nature of whatever has transpired so far. 32 teams started a journey on the 14th of June at Moscow's Luzhniki Stadium. The Giants, almost all of them, kept falling into oblivion with every passing stage. And now, 62 games later, we have the showpiece finale. It will be France against Croatia to determine the winner, a first-time 21st century winner of the 21st edition of the FIFA World Cup on Sunday, back at the Luzhniki Stadium in Moscow. Eugene, uh, the last instance of a team trailing a semi-final but managing to win it was France in 1998. They were 1-0 down and 1-2-1 against Croatia. That was Croatia's only previous appearance in a semi-final at all in a World Cup. They say what goes around comes around and it is coming back around in the most remarkable uh, manner for this World Cup final. They must be you know, in cloud nine right now. I mean, it's, I mean, a victory like that yesterday, I mean, coming down from a goal nil. Actually, England did look in control, and uh, if only Sterling had converted and uh, Harry Kane converted, it would have been a different story. But uh, Croatia capitalized on that, got the momentum, and controlled the game, and now they're in the finals. So, I mean, a history, a history for a generation of footballers that have really tried to do the best for their countries and living up to expectations. Ashley, we will have a time. We will have time for a detailed deep dive uh, later on, of course, through these next few days. Uh, but just as a precursor, what are your quick uh, expectations from this game? The final. Um, to be fair, it's the same old story. Croatia is surely going to be tired. But we said that <laughs> last time. You know, I was reading before that Modric is, is kind of lambasted the English media, saying that they doubted us, they didn't respect us, they told us we'd be tired, and we we took them words and turned it into positive. So. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure France won't be saying Croatia tired because they've seen that they weren't. Um, but you, you, you can't look past France. We've always said right throughout the tournament they've got an extra gear if they're needed. They've got more attacking flair. They've got a better balanced side. But then you can't underestimate Modric and Rakitic and what they bring to Croatia. You know, that could be enough if they get the same domination. So tough to call, but I, I would have to say France.